Good evening. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education work session for February the 10th, 2021. We stand for the pledge. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Members, you've had a chance to look at the agenda. Do I have a motion? Second moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, we have approval of the minutes for February the 3rd, both open and close. Has everybody had a chance to review those? Yep. Have a motion? So moved. Second. Have a motion and second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, we're into discussion. Uh, 201, Edwin Contract. Great, so we're gonna talk about the Edmentum contract as a continuation from last board meeting. Ms. Towers, our CFO, is joining us along with Mr. Ken Top, who is our um, program manager for Arise, but also does our summer learning programs and digital programs. And he also is our um, digital learning connection to Edmentum. I believe that we have Mr. Mark Mazek on the phone and he will call in. We wanted to share with you some data uh, with regard to how we are using Edmentum. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Towers and Mr. Kentop. You want me to do what I was doing or do you want to talk yes. about the data? Um, no, not the okay. data. Okay. Um, so um, I first, uh, President Smith, Dr. Kane, members of the board, I, I want to extend an apology to Ms. Towers and to you all last week. Um, I didn't know I should have been here um, putting that together. I could have probably answered your questions for you then. So I'm here tonight to kind of clarify those questions for you. Um, last week you had asked several questions and I have written them down and given you some answers for them. Um, there was first question was about the yellow sheet from last year's contract and it said on the yellow sheet from June of 2020 through August of 2021 and now the contract this year says from July 2021 to June 2022 so there was a clarification needed on that the first clarification is the yellow sheet from last year if you actually look at the contract underneath of it the contract underneath of it stated from May of 2020 until June of 2021 so there was an error when the yellow sheet was created last year, a, a mistake um, when those numbers were put on that first one. I spoke with Ms. Dubois about that. She went back and looked at a record. She thought it was 14 months starting in June, but there was nothing ever anywhere written on that. And the assumption just, it was an error in making that sheet. So our contract does go until June of this year. The $2,000 credit that you would ask about on that, we weren't receiving a $2,000 credit because of an, uh, an error in that contract from last year. It actually has something to do with our Ed Options program that we used with them last summer. And I'll explain that in a couple minutes as to why we're getting a credit. The questions were also asked last week if this was a flat amount or if it's per student. There were numbers thrown around like 7,500. The number on here is 6,030 and then 1,574 for a younger group. This is a flat cost for the Edmentum. They used the number that they had put on last year's projection to show how many licenses it was. But regardless of what it is, the number is the $68,000 number. If we get an influx this year of a couple hundred students that come back into the system, we don't pay anymore. They are just included in that. We pay for grades three through 12 for the $68,000. The kindergarten through second grade licenses are then given to us free. So it, it, to answer the question, we won't go up or down based on any enrollments. That's a flat number for that contract. Um, there was a question about how many students participated in the exact path program last summer. We had over 600 students who were involved in it at one point or another. The, their involvement was individual, so I can't tell you that they all completed a certain amount, but they were, there were 600 students that were involved in the program. And uh, President Smith, I think you asked, are we looking at an 80% usage? And this school year in the first semester, we're looking at about an 84% usage in the exact path program so far. So just to clarify, Edmentum is the parent program. The exact path that we're paying for you kind of know how we use that. We use that in several ways for universal mitigation. Dr. Kane uh, related to that about last year and this year. 
we also use it as an instructional piece right now when students are like asynchronous. Teachers can assign them to work in it. It's very individualized. Teachers are using it this year as part of their SLOs for evaluations, the data that comes from this, the exact path data. And this year we used it for the kindergarten reading readiness assessment that we have to do that's a Comar regulation. So all those pieces from exact path are what we've used this year um, and look to use again next year. The other parts in this contract though that need to be highlighted are the courseware licenses that we get to use for secondary schools. And there is no charge for them when we, when we have an Edmentum um, exact path a contract. Last summer, we utilized Edmentum's uh, courseware, and this school year we've used it for high school students. They can take courses for original credit, for credit recovery, and we've even created some custom booster courses to help the students who are struggling this year. Edmentum itself has 106 courses that have been approved by MSDE for virtual credit. So of the ones that they have, 106 have been approved. And I'm, do you mind if I take this so off? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> My glasses are getting all fogged up on me. Um, they have 106 courses that have been approved, so we can use them for blended or virtual learning for students to have original credit. But we also use it for the credit recovery and for these booster. And right now we have 450 students, or 450 course enrollments this year so far that we've used for this option, either boosters or credit, original credit or credit recovery. So that's a very significant part of our high school program, helping students to recoup credits if they need to after they maybe weren't successful in a course or in, in this case this year while they're still in a course to help them boost their skills. The other thing we took advantage of this year is what's called flex assignments. And teachers in the high school and next year we're looking to expand it to middle school have the ability when they're teaching to go into one of these classes. So I'm a, say I'm a biology teacher. I can go into the Edmentum biology class and look at what their online course looks like and I can find activities or things in their lessons that I can just pull out singular activities and use it as a resource while I'm teaching. And I can assign it to all my students. So it is another curriculum resource that's available for students and teachers, basically secondary six through 12. Now I don't have exact numbers on how many are using that right now because that's something we're still training people on how to use, but that's another powerful educational tool that teachers can use that comes as part of this contract. Now the one piece I wanna clarify is that $2,000 credit um, on, on this contract. Last year we used their program called Ed Options. And what that did, that allowed us to do is we could assign our students to Edmentum's teachers over the summer and Edmentum's teachers oversaw the program. There was a, a cost to that per student. It was a grant funded, we used grant money for that. Last summer, Edmentum had a lot of struggles in the Ed Options category because they got overwhelmed with everybody in the world trying to find an online program to work with students on. Their student information system was too small. They had to completely change and get a new SIS system. They didn't have enough staff, teachers, because they had so many systems around the world and the country that were trying to get in there and use this. So the experience wasn't the best experience. And, and Mark, I know, is, is on the call with us. He, he, him and I talked a lot about that. And, and he knew that wasn't our best experience. We had, a, we had a lot of students involved, but we had 132 students who had the opportunity to be involved with that, but it didn't go as smoothly as it could have, and we probably didn't get the most out of it. So that's where the $2,000 credit came from. He gave that back and said, if we want to use it for some specific ed options, not as a major program, but he wanted to give us a credit back on some of that because it wasn't so successful last year. So I, I just wanted to kind of clarify some of those things and, and give you some of the numbers um, for usage of what we're doing right now, and then answer any additional questions that you might have. Would Mark be available to speak to the I think he's on the um, uh, data that's been collected and that he shared with us? Mm -hmm. Can you hear us? Mark, Is can you hear us? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So, yes. Um, so I, uh, first of all, thank you for letting me join. Um, I am your local consultant for the past six years. I'm a former administrator from Scrap, Pennsylvania, um, where I used Edmentum Solutions when I was in the district. Um, I currently live in Rehoboth Beach, not too far from you. So I imagine that the data, and maybe um, uh, Mr. Kintop or Dr. King could clarify that if you have the information and data that I shared with the color code, green and yellow. Yes, lines. yes, we do, thank you. So you all have that that you're looking at? We don't have it on the screen, but we have access okay. to it. Um, can, uh, can I share my screen with them? Yes. Absolutely. Yes, go ahead. I'll do that right now. And just give me a shout when you 
you see that. Okay, you're you're up. Perfect. Thank you so much. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I do want to just kind of scratch the surface because your district does have great usage. Mr. Kent's Act did a great job of explaining the use of, of the program and the different types of programs that are embedded within the district. Um, the bottom line, we're just going to go from top to bottom. The total number of students that are in the program are 7,000. 199 students. So that means they're in the system. Do all students access and use it? Probably not, but in regards to the total amount in, that's what's in the system of now. When we look at the diagnostic one and diagnostic two, and just to kind of give you some quick background, students take a diagnostic test and then they receive a learning path based on the results of that test. So for diagnostic one and diagnostic two for math and reading, the numbers are there. Uh, we're not going to go through each sign with the numbers, uh, but you have great uses in regards to the students taking the assessment. And what I did was, since I'm a visual person, I kind of color coded each line by grade level of positive growth being green and yellow being some growth, but not reaching the average growth. And not to get too deep here into the numbers, but we have an average growth measure because what happens is students are compared to other students that take this assessment in that grade level. So the green, which is awesome, are students that exceeded the typical growth measure. So for example, kindergarten, typical growth is 58 points. Your, or your first grade students, rather, their growth was 73.9 points. So they're actually above the average growth bar. You'll also notice in the last column that not everybody has completed that diagnostic yet. So this is the second diagnostic. So currently still keep that diagnostic. We ran these numbers um, after last board meeting. I was out listening and I jumped right on it. And um, so I'm sure those numbers have increased in, in regards to the amount of who took the assessment. So you can kind of follow that chart going down. That's from math, of course. Uh, green is you know growth above the average. Yellow is growth that's very close to it. Um, if you look at the reading section, uh, you have more students who took the reading section, and you'll notice the growth in green as well, and yellow. And the last part of the graph is a learning path data. And this is more of averages of what students are doing within the learning path. You know, the number of active students that are working the learning paths, the average time on task, after students on the computer do nothing, after working and completing modules, the average skills mastered, and average skills assessed. So all of those numbers are where they should be in regards to matching up to the diagnostic and usage for the total number of students using the program. I want to hold it up for any questions. Board members, any questions? I think we're okay right now. And the one thing I'll add to that is the numbers that you see for the growth numbers, the average growth numbers that they compare to, are based on the history of students being in full school all the time. Like they don't have data to be able to measure off of what happens when kids are home during a crisis like this. So for us to have the numbers in the yellow and the green that we have right now is actually a strong sign, you know, that we are making some progress with the kids even at a distance. More questions? Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. But I think we do have an update to the yellow sheet. No, no update to the yellow sheet. Okay. And that is the, because this is the action item later. Does the board have any questions? Because they're going to, no use to stay around me. Is there any, there's no questions right now? No. no. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mizek. Thank you. Thank, thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Moving on, 2-202, um, uh, Clay Target Team update. Good evening, President Smith, members of the board, and Dr. Kane. For the record, my name is Carla Pullen. I'm the interim chief operating officer and have been working on the Clay Target team. We have been honing in this week on the MOU. So along with the school's attorney, we are ready to share the draft with Mr. Burns, which should be coming to him soon if it hasn't already. 
along with that MOU, we've decided that it would be good to devise some specific rules and procedures that are definitive to the clay target team. Um, this is going to pull information from the athletic handbooks. It will pull from the U.S. Clay Target League, their policies and procedures, um, and it will pull from Sudlersville Skeet Club from their rules and procedures as well. We're still awaiting those. There was a family emergency, so the person that we've been speaking with hasn't been able to get those to us yet, but they're forthcoming. It's also prompted us to take a look at our athletics handbook just to make sure that it's up to date as well. And then the beauty of these documents is they're going to be appropriate templates for us to utilize for all of our sports programs so that we can assure going forward this template is utilized, we have something consistent, and all of the programs are utilizing the same thing. So at this point, we'll be ready to share that document with Mr. Conley, the proposed coach, within the week, provided that Mr. Burns concurs with that information. Um, we also believe that it will be wise to have that MOU signed with any assistant coaches that would be uh, proposed as well, along with Mr. Conley. And with that, I will open up to any questions that you may have about any of the activities that we've discussed or any of the new information. How are we doing with insurance? Has that all been mopped up? So we are still coordinating with MABE. So MABE has always given us the recommendations of what they would like to see based on the dollar thresholds that they would anticipate if in the event that there was a problem, it could potentially be catastrophic with this type of sport. They've always given us those guidelines. Um, we have reached out to Sellersville Skeet. We have looked at the U.S. Clay Target League, and they've been able to provide what they're able to provide. So at this point, the conversation with MABE has really turned to what is necessary. Are there umbrella policies? that we need to look at, and so we're looking at those and pricing those. Um, is there additional coverage that the Board of Ed needs to provide to fill the gap of what is not going to necessarily be able to be provided by U.S. Clay Target League or from Sellersville Ski Club? In a nutshell, one, I guess one of my concerns is there's a time, not a time frame, but this thing is sign up for the spring, which is the end of this month, 1st of March. Insurance, I know we've been going over this for a while. Yes. Will insurance be taking care of that in, in, a, in a, I'm, not, I'm just yes. saying a week or something to yes. get, a, get an answer so we can make some decisions on yes, it will work or whatever? Yes, so we absolutely can do that very quickly. But I will point out, and, and this is something that we're working to figure out all of these issues as quickly as possible. Um, we do have through March 22nd to do the registration, and then their practices start April 3rd. So March 22nd. Yes, yes, we can register through March 22nd. So we're still able to meet those guidelines provided that we have everything decided within the next week or so. So you've, I mean, I, things pop up, but do you feel comfortable within a week you, you can have the answer to the board and Dr. Kane yes, to find out so we absolutely. can move this forward? Yes. Okay. You know, we really appreciate the work you guys have all put into this. It's, it, we've had a lot of questions, so thank you. Thank, thank you for your time. And one more question. Sure. Um, so what Mabe is doing is recommending what they would like to see, right? It's not a mandate. We're not required to have that. No. But And it's my understanding that there is a $400,000 cap. Um, if there is a lawsuit, are you aware of that? or? I am. I'm not sure how it's applicable here. So what I, I, with the logistics of that, I would prefer to get Mabe's response on that and then sure. bring that back to you. Okay. And then right now, what do we know we have <clears throat> as an insured figure? Again, the dollar amounts, I would want to speak directly with Mabe because I think there are different parts of that that come into play depending on the incident. If the if the question is what is the dollar amount per incident, then I can get that for you. Sure. Provide okay. It. Well, just, yeah, just in the course of what you're doing already. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it is still the two policies. Is that correct? Settlers Bill will have one with the and we'll correct a, another named. Um, yes, so we would be named, insured. yes, as well as with the U.S. Clay Target League. Correct. And does this um, extra insurance get paid by the board or paid by the club? That's something that we would have to determine. Um, and then and who's responsible? Exactly. Those, if those the board are, is paying for it, then 
the board is reliable. Correct. If the club is paying for it, then the club is liable. Yes. Okay. But you feel comfortable, and I know it could go out, but next week, which is the 17th, we probably would have some firmer answers. March 22nd is the last day of registration, so if this gets done within the next week to 10 days, it looks like it's it's doable as long as all the dots get lined up. Yes. Yes. You'll come with that, Dr. Kane? Well, um, before I respond to that, I want to find out from Mr. Schifanelli what he found out from your board attorney with regard to who has authority to make this decision. Well, we have discussed it, and uh, it's uh, I, obviously, you know, it's between the board and, and the attorney. I'd rather have the attorney discuss that with you, but putting on my own attorney hat and having read the statutes, um, I believe that it's within the board's jurisdiction. It's a new sports program, and part of the reasoning is because I understand that your responsibilities as superintendent pertain to two broad categories, day-to-day -day activities of the school, the curriculum, that sort of thing, um, and specifically, explicitly, it says day-to-day -day activities. The Sporting Clays uh, Club would not be, I don't think falls into the day-to-day -day activities of the, the student body, you know, that kind of thing. Um, your other broad category is student-run organizations. For example, um, uh, student government, uh, maybe the student newspaper, something like that, would be uh, literally a student-run organization. This is something different. Like the football team is, is not a student-run organization. The students are the athletes, but the coaches, you know, the adults are, are uh, running the program. They're responsible for the program, ultimately. So it would be the same thing with the sporting clays. That Mr. Connolly would be the coach. Obviously, he'd have some assistant coaches. You know, as we go along, they would be coordinating activities, coordinating the shoots, the competitions, practice, and everything else. The students wouldn't be doing that uh, themselves. So that's my perspective. Um, I would rather have Darren talk. Was that his perspective? This is my perspective. Um, his perspective. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I would rather have him address his perspective. Because quite frankly, th that is not the legal perspective. The superintendent okay. has authority over that as a student activity. And if in fact it was a sport, then it would be uh, governed by MPSSA, a, a, which it is not. So, and, and in regard to our policy 524, that puts the superintendent. Well, you know, well let, let, me, let, let, let me take me, a look at what Darren. <clears throat> let me just interject something here. The board, I think, generally would like to see this go forward. We've done some research on it and everything. By all means, you're the superintendent, and hopefully, we all can collaborate together to make this work. We I am not. We I have been. I understand. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm saying we clear. all collaborate together. So hopefully, this can come as a consensus of everybody, and as you, as superintendent, can take it and uh, not run with it, but take it and, and make it happen. Um, I don't think anybody need, wants their, you know, to, to take ownership of it as far as individual pride. I think we just need to work together. Yeah, I don't think it has anything to do with pride. I think that at this point it has to do with who makes the decision. Well, that's yeah. what, that's, so that's according to the, the board attorney, uh, the only reference to um, Dr. Kane's purview would be day-to-day -day activities of the, of the schools. And this does not fit into a day-to-day -day activity. Why doesn't this fit into a day-to-day? -day? Of the school. Pretty much like I just uh, mentioned, it's not something, it's not the entire student body that's involved in this. It's uh, administered and, and run by um, adults, coaches. Um, you know, football activities are not day-to-day -day activities of the student body. Um, for example, curriculum uh, and certain extracurricular activities. And so are you activities. suggesting that the superintendent has no authority over the sports teams with the schools? I think in the creation of a sports team, no. Did you, I mean, were you the one that, or is a superintendent's job to say we're going to have a football team? In, or is in, it the in, board? In fact, um, if it is a new sport, there is a protocol for that. And where's that? Gonna be 
you because I asked you go, uh, by email to go please through provide that. The Maryland Public Secondary Schools Athletic Association MPSSAA. There is a protocol for having a new sport. Okay, um, so this, and this is what is I need not, to see. And this is not one of them. And in addition, please do check our Queen Anne's County Policy 524 that outlines student organizations. Um, and pertinent to this conversation, the superintendent or designee shall approve all student organizations, both school sponsored and non sponsored, within the school system. Okay, that's why I emailed you a couple of weeks ago to please provide me what you're relying on. And I know that you spoke with your board attorney and, and your interpretation, and we agreed to disagree, your interpretation was different, and I want to be sure that you had ample opportunity to, yeah. as, a, as an attorney by trade to look and see what you could find. Right. Well, that's what I was, I was interpreting what I had found, so that's why I asked you, what have you found so, now so you, I can look at that it. too. Yeah. But, yeah. That's but great. Let, let me be clear. Mr. Schmelli is an attorney by trade, but he is a board member not acting as any attorney up here at this level. That is absolutely 100% correct. So, so he has he has his opinion and I, I respect it. I respect your opinion. I hope that we can sit there and work because I think this is a, something that would be unique to Queen Anne's County. Would be would be good to work forward if we can get the proper insurance and stuff like that. I hope little pitfalls don't get involved with this. Um, I think we should all just try to work together. I'm not trying I think, to no, yeah, go finish what you I'm saying. not trying to undermine you. I don't think any board member is trying to, and you mean some more people are passionate about this, and I just um, want to hopefully all five work together. I'm Six not, of us. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm not so sure that there is not some undermining going on, but to be clear, we have been absolutely collaborative. We have done all of the research, and we found that we can use some of this information in other areas where it has been lax, and there have not and been. This could MOUs. be a positive thing for many ways, both upping our game as far as policies and hopefully getting this, if it works out, insurance wise and policy wise to get it on and one of my major concerns is and I you know not right now but in other things working with the county on different regulations people keep I just want to you know we have a time frame and you're saying March the 22nd we have time to do our due diligence get this through collaborate together work together and make this work if it can work um, if you can get back to us within seven to ten days uh, we'll get this and then hopefully as a group all five, six of us, five board members and the superintendent can work on to move this thing forward. Okay, and one more request. If you could please email me the protocol and the uh, other policies that you're talking about, at least the references to them where I can find them, because I did ask you, I haven't got it. Maryland Public School Secondary Schools Athletic Association, the acronym is MPSSAA, yep. and policy 524. You can take a look at those. Okay. Protocol or policy? Policy 524, right. Queen Anne's County Policy 524. Queen Anne's County Policy, all right. Student organization. All right, and uh, I'll take a look at those, and if you can keep doing that, I'd like to get a vote next week, and then we can... Uh, if it down. comes to a vote, because I'm not so certain that it comes to well, a vote. Well, sure. It might not need a vote. Hopefully, Definitely. it can get worked out, and it, it, can, it can be moved forward. With, with if, that is, if that is what happens, mm -hmm. we, we, we will see. We can continue to prolong it or, or, I don't want, or not. I want, we can prolong it, but I, I, I don't want to just prolong it just to prolong it to, to miss something. I think we need to act on it and hopefully get Agreed. good information that's accurate and hopefully we can move this because I think it's an opportunity. I think one of the things that you know, a lot of children or kids, students, but you've involved this that aren't necessarily physically athletes, they can do a lot of things. So I think it gives us one more opportunity to, to get another group of students involved in, very, in our thing. So very inclusive. I think we need to work on this. Big thing. Uh, end of discussion right now and we'll move on with the caller. Thank you for your information and we'll be for, looking forward to you next week. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Pollard. And I do also want to say, because I wasn't done with my comment, Mr. Smith, mm -hmm. that uh, I think that it is not as simple as a collaboration here because we absolutely have been collaborating, but the issue is the decision. So we need to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Kane, it's, I think it's clear that you're opposed to creating the organization. Is that correct? Absolutely. And can I ask why? Not it's really, always... not at this point. Well, actually, uh, yes, it's always, you can. Whenever because there's... it's always good for the public to understand. Yeah. One, I think that at this point in time, we've heard parent after parent after parent talk about the mental condition of children, the mental health of children. And for us to think about putting guns in the hands of children right now, if a parent wants to put a weapon 
in the hand of their child, that is absolutely their prerogative. I do not believe that it has to be associated with the school district in order for them to do that. Nothing prohibits a parent from doing what they want to do. There is a fee involved. Nothing prohibits a parent from doing what they want to do to have their children engage with weapons. That is a culture, and I completely understand that. But I do not see it fitting with a public school district. All right. I appreciate that. You are more than welcome. Yeah. All right. Okay, moving on. Uh, opening of schools, 2-03. I'll ask Ms. Pullen to come okay. on back up and Ms. Bass. We don't, we don't have another presentation because we're moving forward with exactly what we, we started uh, talking about or continue talking about last week. We are, I'll let Ms. Pullen talk, but we are prepared for our students. Uh, we met with principals today. There was not um, issue with uh, anything in regard to starting with our hybrid plan. But as I said that we would, we have uh, talked to principals about pulling our teams back together to look at full day hybrid schedule so that they are aware that we're going to be looking at that, um, as I said, that they would. So, Ms. Pullen, what updates do you have for us? So I can tell you that transportation worked very diligently today to get all of the bus routes out to contractors in the event that we have inclement weather the next two days. So the bus drivers will be taking those routes. They'll be riding them. They will be looking at times. They'll be figuring out how the cleaning of their buses play into that. And then they will be calling all students this weekend so they know what their anticipated times are for the start on the 16th. That, who, the, bus, the bus drivers are going to call each student? Yes. So Yes, they call the parents. Our for contract bus students. drivers, which are mostly of our bus drivers, are going to call, and I guess it's, it's the same bus routes are the same as last year. So if you had, you know, whoever, Mr. Smith, Ms., uh, whoever, you had the same one as next year. Yes, so they know for that. the most part, that's okay. the case. Now, if you recall, we will only have one student per seat mm -hmm. on every bus, so those routes may have changed slightly as well as the drivers, but the students and the schools, the schools have been in communication with the parents throughout this entire time so they know of the changes and they're already aware. When will those bus drivers be calling the parents? It will depend based on the LLC's direction. So uh. they've spoken with their contract drivers, but it should be any time between now and Monday evening. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Sure. I'm a parent and I don't have a call on Friday. And my daughter's and son sitting there, what's going on? I don't get one Saturday, I don't get one Sunday. People get nervous. Sure. Who can, and, and don't give them my number, because I don't know, but who can they call to find out who should be calling them or something, because Monday's a holiday. Yes. And you know, it, it, it's just the last minute, some child getting on the bus, knowing what time. I think parents need to have a little bit of window, and if they don't have that window, and I'm, you know, by let's say Monday, or something, who could they call to say, I haven't called, can somebody please call me? I know it's a holiday, so I don't know how we're going to handle that. Sure. So if you recall, most of this communication already happened in November as well. So when we were preparing for our hybrid start, a lot of this information was disseminated to families. But with that, if there is any question and someone hasn't received that information from their driver, the first point of contact would be the school. So contact your school. The school will be able to tell them who the driver is and will be able to give them contact information. The second point of contact can be the transportation office here at the Board of Ed. We can certainly put them in touch with the driver as well as give them the preliminaries on the times and what we anticipate. So if there are any questions. Okay, but after Friday at five or six o'clock when everybody goes home, right. you're not going to get a hold of the school. You're not going to get a hold of the transportation department. It could be Tuesday morning when we're supposed to be picking up kids. That's what bothers me. With the And uh, these LLC are good, but somebody doesn't call them, all of a sudden Sunday, Monday, they don't get a call, there, there's going to be no way for the parents to call. Yes, yeah. And I'm just, you know, 
did the parents, the most of these parents know what bus or picking them up in their drivers or I mean? Yes, yes, that information has already gone out and this would be the second time that that has gone out. So the only discrepancy that could potentially occur is if the uh, request has been made to switch the AA or BB days, some of that information may have changed. But again, that's something that the school has already been in touch with okay. all of those parents and families about. So, so what I would suggest is that for if there is a parent who as of the time that they see this, this broadcast, if they are unsure, they still have tomorrow and Friday to contact the school so that we can get it clarified for them. Now that's that's what I would suggest highly that if you have not, if you feel uneasy and you don't know what's going, you know, what's with this thing, call by at least noon on Friday so we have time to react both from the principal's aspect or the transportation because after four or five o'clock, there won't be anybody around. Yes. Okay. That so people help. really need to get out there and, you know, if they have a question about transportation, call your principal Friday. Uh, and, and get that done because Monday is a holiday. Yes. Another thing I got to mention too is social, you know, make sure you're socially responsible because we have worked tirelessly on cleaning these schools and doing things. If your children have a fever or so any symptoms of this COVID, we, we need to take, keep them home because, you know, it, 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 could be, it could be a real quick you know, problem if we start having issues and parents have to be very diligent about what they're doing when they send their kids because, um, you know, we're cleaning, we're doing this, but it's just, but, but it's going to put pressure a lot more pressure on our system if parents don't pay attention to this too. On symptoms of anything, pink eye, right. strep throat, because when you weaken the immune system with something, it opens the door for everything else. So if they're sick with anything, they err on the side home. of caution. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, just questions and uh, actually a couple comments. Um, we're still talking about schools uh, reopening and how that's going. So I did have the pleasure to be with Dr. Kane and Helen, uh, Miss uh, Bennett, yesterday at the uh, Sudlersville Elementary School, and uh, we made a tour. We were probably there for about two hours. It was extremely informative. Um, Mr. Tom Walls, the principal, uh, took us around. We talked to him probably for an hour. Um, all kinds of things from logistics. Uh, practical matters, some abstract matters. And um, we were uh, there during lunchtime, so we saw how the uh, kids were uh, behaving extremely well and coming in, getting their lunches, either taking them back to their classrooms or eating there uh, with their you know, social distance, but still being able to talk and communicate with uh, Mr. Walls, who they seem to adore, and uh, the other teachers. Um, Mr. Walls, I gotta give credit where credit's due. Mr. Walls has got a excellent uh, can-do attitude, and more importantly, his teachers and staff do as well. I was, I was very, very impressed. And um, he talked about, uh, well, I mentioned logistics. Um, I know we're about to go into the budget review here. Uh, he said more than anything, I asked him about his wish list and his needs list, and he said there's nothing on his wish list. There's one teacher that he needs, fourth grade teacher, on his uh, must-have list. And um, so as we go along through the budget, I'd like to everybody to keep that in mind, if we can figure out somehow to get uh, Sellersville Elementary, another four, uh, fourth grade teacher. Um, They've been going full-time hybrid since uh, we have come back to class. Uh, they haven't had any issues. It looks to me like they've got things uh, worked out safely, uh, including lunch and that kind of thing. Um, I commend Dr. Kane because we had come to a decision about March 1st being the target date to reopen uh, half-day hybrid for all the schools. Um, it's my understanding, it seems like you're on track to do that much earlier, right? A couple weeks earlier, February 16th, right. I think is the date. Um, I'd like to make a motion that uh, we identify a date for a full-time hybrid uh, reopening when the schools transition from their part-time to full-time. Um, I'm suggesting Mar March 8th, but I'd like to put that up for discussion and, and see if we can come to a date. I think it's important that we have a, a full-time date. Is that a motion? So I would move. Is that a motion? Well, the motion is to... Uh, uh, that the schools return, or that the schools implement a full-time hybrid schedule on March 8th, 2021. Okay, for, I would need a second for any discussion. 
Does anybody want to second that? I'll second. Okay. We'll open this for discussion. My opinion is we are we haven't even gotten our schools in back in hybrid for the 16th yet. And I think uh, our direction with Dr. Kane is that we will try to get it open more as we go the whole time. I have a real problem on the setting a date that's, I don't know if it's obtainable. I mean, we got transportation things, Suntersville, and I don't know enough about it. I'm not going to get Carl, Carl into this, but just from what I've heard, and please somebody tell me when I'm off base. The tier system of our transportation, I don't know if it can handle that, because in Suntersville it's a smaller group, but you just get on Canal or Centerville, I, I don't know if we could do that, so there'd be too many obstacles in our way. I think if any school can do it, and we can get to transportation, then we move forward uh, in, as soon as we can. And I think that's been the direction, and I think even Dr. Keynes agreed to that. But I would have a con concern, we don't know, I mean, there's so many things we don't even know, we're not even back on our full hybrid yet until the 16th. I think that can be a discussion in the future, but I don't know setting a date it would be premature in my opinion. But I, that's my two cents. Other members? I think we need to see how the half-day hybrid works first to see if numbers continue to come down, if we have any outbreaks in the school, let teachers get comfortable with the current cleaning and PPE because there's still a lot of worry and fear for those who have not been in the buildings give them time to get comfortable and into into a groove again and see if anything happens that that needs to be we need to take time and correct and fix before we move and let these teams who are working on a full day hybrid schedule do the work Point of order. Let, let, point let, point let, of okay, order. Let everybody have one, and then, uh, thank you. then we'll have rebuttal. Mr. Smith, point of order that everyone has to speak. Yeah, um, you thank go you. ahead, Tammy. I didn't realize. We're... So, yeah, thank you. So, uh, following along with Ms. Morissette, not everyone's been vaccinated yet. We need to have time to get everyone vaccinated with their second round. Again, we need the, this has to happen organically. We can't force a date. We have tried three times to force a date for the, on this school system, and it just didn't work. We need to work with the people in our system, not against them. That's my point. Helen? And I, would, I just want to say that I know that Dr. Kane had said last week that she was going to get back with her executive team and we're going to work on that full day hybrid. So, you know, I trust that it's moving along. And um, I too was so impressed with um, Sutlersville Elementary and just, um, it was, it was just a can do. We're going to, this is where Mr. Walls kept saying it over and over. He said, all of our teachers said, this is where we're needed. Our kids need us to be back, you know, in the classroom. And, and it was so nice to see, oh my goodness, the kids were so excited. Um, of course, Mark's fluent Spanish made a big hit in, in many of the classrooms. Um, and he was a little celebrity over there, but we appreciated the tour that Dr. Kane um, set up for us. And so I, I think we're moving along and, um, and, it, and I think it take, we'll take a while for the teachers to get used to it. I mean, it was really very cool to see the teachers in their classroom there. That was just seamless. They were on their computers, you know, talking to their, um, a couple of them had one or two students virtual and they're doing their little numbers and they're answering and they did it so well of just engaging their in-person people and their virtual people. And, and that is that probably took them a little bit of time to just make it seamless, because it seems super easy watching them. And um, Mr. Walls made sure he, that we knew that it wasn't that simple initially, and they've just kind of gotten on it. So I, you know, I trust that we're moving forward and um, very excited about getting the kids back in, because those children were happy. They looked very happy to be in school. And I was not that happy when I was in school. So. <laughs> They were very happy. Yes. So my position is that <clears throat> if we can open up by the 15th or 16th, as Dr. Kane is, is projecting, the, we're all we're, working we're, towards just to make well. sure the 16th, because 15th, 16th, I'm 16th, sorry. 16th I, I just wanted to public get confused. Sure. 16th, so I'm roping it up. All right, 16th. Uh, and we're on track. We're ahead of schedule. Um, you know, my position is that if we set a date that everybody can work toward, then we, 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 they'll, they'll do that. Um, uh, maybe it's just my, you know, method from the military, whatever. But you, you have time constraints. You got time restraints. Uh, that th kind of thing that you want to put out there for people as to guide on. Um, so, you know, it's three weeks after the 16th, three weeks or so. It's uh, more than one week after the March 1st opening date that was the target. Uh, I think there's ample time to 
have three weeks of, of uh, uh, half-day hybrid, which will give time to work the bugs out and to and to get some planning done for a full-day hybrid. They've had, uh, I think they were given the order back in the summer to come up with a full-day hybrid program. Of course, the only one that did was uh, Southersville Elementary. Now, they were not, to be clear, they were not given an order to come up with a full-day hybrid. They were, we planned for a hybrid, and the full-day issue is something that has come up recently. All right, then I retract that. I thought they were, they were, there was a request out there to, mm -hmm. to provide, make a plan. But um, in any case, if we're going to wait too long, then it's going to be the middle of April and middle of May and graduation. So, you know, it's a, again, it's going to be more than a year that these kids haven't been in school. Even at the half day hybrid, they're only uh, they're in school for literally one day out of five, you know, in a week um, in person learning. So. That's all I got to say. And Dr. Kane, we're, we're, February the 16th, we're starting with our AB hybrid schedule. Mm -hmm. Suttersville is a little unique. It's doing something a little different. And I think all schools, in my opinion, are working to do as open up as much as they can if it's suitable with your Absolutely. thing. So we're working that. The motion on the um, floor from uh, Ms. Chavinelli is uh, to do this March the 8th, 8th. Um, <clears throat> open up uh, that. Uh, so I think what we're going to have to do is have a roll call on this motion. Ms. Wright. Please answer when I call your name. Mr. Schifanelli? Aye. Mr. Smith? No. Ms. Bennett? No. Ms. Harper? No. Ms. Morset? No. Okay, I have four negative and one affirmative. At this time, the motion doesn't carry. All right. Okay. Uh, opening of schools. Any other? Just to give you a quick update that food service meal plan is on schedule. We will be doing the grab and go meals for both breakfast and lunch. PPE is stocked. We have reserves. It is available in every classroom as well as cleaning supplies. And as you heard last week, athletics are on target to start this Saturday. And we've right now we've got a good supply. I know you've talked about burn rates, but we've got a good supply of what we think. You'll reassess that after a week or something, or yes. next first day probably of doing that to make sure that we are up in each each school has its own uh, thing there. Yes. Okay. Any other questions or things? Um, as far as PPE classes that may have a little more personal contact with students, have they been trained to the full extent with all the PPE, the shields, the gloves, the like yes. if they're changing diapers, doing feeding tubes. Yes, okay. trained as well as we have both the PPE coordinator and the nursing staff at each school that's able to assist with any questions about PPE use. There's a document that's available to everyone within the district that outlines what type of PPE should be utilized for what type of situation. So, yes. So your general classroom, just to, to get a visual, at the desk, you the teacher's desk. Does the teacher have plexiglass? No, at this time, there is no individual plexiglass for either the teacher desks or the student desks. I can tell you that is something that with our future grant funding, we are discussing the possibility for necessity of those as well. Okay. And just to wrap this up, we are opening up on the 16th transportation if you have any issues please call the principal by the 12th which is this Friday I, I'm saying noon but don't wait until the last minute so we can make it um, if you know your bus driver they're gonna try to they'll get to you by then or over the weekend so if you haven't heard from them it's not necessarily a problem but if you have concerns I think you need to call the, uh, your principal first and then uh, the transportation department on the 12th because like I said Monday's a holiday and we'll be back on our AB hybrid on uh, Tuesday and thank you for all your help. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bass, did you want to share anything? Staffing? Vaccine. Vaccine. There we go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for whatever the three extra vaccines. I'm Vanessa Bass for the good of the cause, HR director. Good after. Good evening. <laughs> We've been moving right along. Um, 275 people have received their first shot. I don't have reports out on the second shot because they do not have to disclose to me because of the HIPAA, their second shot appointment. 
I just want to make that clear. So 275, 100 other people got invited on Monday. That clinic will take place on Friday. Again, I say please do not share the link. Please keep your appointment on time and do not take an appointment if you already had your, your first shot. Let me ask you one question. We have roughly 1,100 employees. Roughly. So right now, 375 after this week should be have their first round of vaccinations. Let's do 275. 275 now. Plus 100. 100 have been invited. So that we should at the end of time maybe 375. I don't want to guarantee y'all 100 are going to be there. Understand? <laughs> but we we're, we're working at this. Yeah. The ones that have signed up, we have six, seven hundred maybe that want to get the shot. Well, they say they want to get the shot, but let me let me clarify that. They can get the shot at several different locations in, in the Upper Shore. Mm -hmm. And even though they may have committed that they wanted to get the shot initially, then I think it's 600 people. We have 696 instructional staff. Mm -hmm. That does not count the other 500 or so that work in other job groups. Mm -hmm. um, so when we get it back, then I know. But I have gotten the attendance sheet back from the health department, usually on Monday. Day, and I see a lot of people did not make that appointment. So that's why I say, don't hold it up for somebody else that would really, really go. Mm -hmm. And don't give it to anybody if they're not a school employee. That would be bus drivers, custodian, calf workers, permanent school assistants, and teachers, principals, and assistant principals. Secretaries. And secretaries. Thank you so much. And and, and the one thing I say is, like, I think you're right on the mark. You know, it, it's, you know we have a, a responsibility to our, our staff you have, everybody has an idea and I know it's the health department running this and they check the way they're gonna do it we have no control over that except your contact with how many people are given I'd suggest everybody take their ID with them because then you show that you're a board educator or you know uh, Queen Anne's County Public School System employee because somebody might just ask you and if you go there and you don't have it you know I, I, you know, we're not, we can't vaccinate everybody. We're just trying to put the, you know, we've done 1A, we're in 1B. Um, it's, you know, we need to, everybody needs to cooperate. Absolutely. But thank you for what you're doing. Oh. Can I ask a question? If you don't mind. Do we have any, any more subs? Oh, that, that, have been? that was my, oh. all my, I got all my stuff right here for you. <laughs> We have 47 day-to-day -day subs as of 46 when I came downstairs. One more that's been processed today So since I came, since 4 o'clock, 4.30. So it's 47 day-to-day. -day. That is different from long-term subs. We have a 45 total that will be doing the ADA, and we have 35 of them covered. So we only need 10 more LTSs. That's every day. The commitment would be every day, same classroom, same teacher until June 11th. Well, I think it's June 11th, to give or take a snow day or two. We'll find LTS. Long-term oh, subs. Long -term sub. Every day. It's fast. Can I ask a quick question about para Mm -hmm. subs, or subs, pair of subs, pair of teaching. Pair of professionals. Pair of professionals. Thank you. <laughs> well, just because I had someone reach out, and they had also talked to a pair of professional, and she was also a pair of professional. And they found out that they had been attached to a school, and so they did not, they didn't get, I'm just going by what this woman told me, they did not get information about long-term sub possibilities because it showed that they were already assigned. In a position. So the one other person she told me about said that she had actually un enroll herself from the school and then reapply for a long-term sub is do we know if that's happening I mean is there a possibility that there's more subs? we, we got we, we, okay. we're playing vocabulary here okay. so if it's a substitute day-to-day -day and they're out there they can either apply for a day-to-day -day or five-hour per. This is going to get really deep in the weeds, so you might have to have a phone conversation with me because those are all temp position at, with five-hour pers. It's as need and based on the funding that goes to that. Usually, um, a Title One um, special ed funded. So I don't know if that person is a five-hour or is it a person a day-to-day -day sub or the person has the qualification to be a long-term sub. So that tell that person um, to give me a call and we can have a one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. We can have a tutorial. Thank you. I think that's the person you'd call eight because it's complicated how it's the tiers and set up. But it sounds like we're getting pretty close 
a lot closer than I thought we were going to be. Begging, pleading, barring. Mm. We'll keep working at it. Mm. And I, I and I'm hope once we, I mean, our vaccinations, I mean, aren't going as fast as we'd like, but they are they are moving on. Um, and once we get back and I think we see what our system's like, I think we're going to see some real positive flow and then we'll get back to not not the old norm, but the new norm. And uh, hopefully we'll get things rolling. It'll be the new normal. There'll be, be no norm. But I mean, it's, it's I think once you, it's like anything, once you get started, you know, first day is a little tough and, you know. <laughs> once they see the kids, they all go and, and the kids will want to see it's each other. Be great. Just like you saw at Southlessville. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Minnie. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Bass. No problem. Thank you. Do we have anything else for opening of schools? No, nope. unless there are other questions. Any other questions by the board? No. I mean. Okay, we'll move on. Mrs. Towers, budget review. Can I take my mask off? Oh yeah, definitely. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Kane, board members. I think I have to get closer. Yeah, pull it to you. Okay. Good evening. Tonight we're going to dive into those budget books here. Um, I handed out before the meeting a couple pieces of information that we'll use tonight. The first being uh, this two-pager. It's the approved budget. Any um, transfer notices that were done through this year to give an updated budget for this current fiscal year. And how that's important is it falls through on year five average on the five-year comparison. So everything in gray is going to match what is on the reconciled budget in addition to what is in your budget book for the year. So I'm gonna start by opening up the budget book for fiscal year 20 because it gives good detail on each line item as we go through. So with this paper with the yellow and gray, the five-year comparison, we're gonna look at administration first. And I've highlighted anything that's over 5% or uh, any type of variance that needs maybe further clarification. So um, we'll look at admin first. If we look at the first one, the variance is 208. And that 208 says human resource officer. Just want to note that that is, it was a half year salary in 20. So that's why it looks higher in 21 because we have a full year salary in 21. The next one under staff specialist, there is um, 100, 130%. And that is because there's an open position with a communication specialist. The next one under salaries, under administration, that I'd like to bring your attention to would be the auto allowance. The auto allowance is a 113%, and that was because there was a half year. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Get me on the, what page I'm on? on. Oh, uh, on the front page? Oh, we're on this one now. Okay, gotcha. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm jumping sorry. around. I apologize. Okay, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I have my sleeves rolled up. We're diving right in here. Okay. Um, the auto allowance, we're at 1370 under administration. Uh, again, that percentage is 113. And the reason why it's 113 is because in 20, there was a half year auto allowance. So this year it takes into account the full year auto allowance. Another item of note under salaries and administration would be your secretary hourly. And this is for the front office staff and doing some research on that. And why is that? And why would we have such a huge jump in the that material? Uh, before it wasn't an, in my understanding, before it wasn't an allocated expense, but we do have a, a need um, for a secretary out front. So we've been using hourly people instead of uh, having someone right. full because time. There, there isn't really positions because they are temporary employees and we had three of them that we were rotating out at the front until we ran into COVID and we had to make other arrangements. So it wasn't allocated at all prior, but the dollars were being spent. Okay. 
So that's all I had for salaries under administration. Does anyone have any questions? And I'll keep going down in admin under contract services. If there's not any questions. The next one I have highlighted is auditing. The delta on that is 114%. The reason being is it's a five, I believe it's a five year contract that they have now with TGM, three or maybe three or five, I can't remember which, but it caps out, I believe the last year at 51,100. So just want to put that note, it, they came in low, it looks like their bid and will gradually increase. The next one is I want to bring your attention to is legal. And it's gone the other way at 81%. And just want to consider maybe increasing that line item. The next one, consultants. We have 31,000. This is through PenServe, the contract CFO, and JLW. The next one, license agreement. It's um, percentages. 153, and what this category is comprised of is board docs, EAC, and let me just talk about EAC a little bit further. EAC is, is something that we're in the process of getting ready to ro roll out to our employees. It's short for Employee Access Center, and this will allow employees to have their own uh, login and password where they can view their pay stubs, their W-2s, and so forth. So we're in the process, the finance department's working hard on, on getting that rolled out and implemented. And that contract is going to cost how much? It is currently in there now. So that the expenses to date is running about 17000 Okay. So we're short about 5000 there. Okay. And you don't have to get a bid on that? It's... Is that, it's not a sole source. Um, it's under. It's seventeen thousand total. Okay, so it doesn't need to be. Okay, right. thank you. Yes. All right. So that's contract services. The next one is supplies and materials. And we're still under administration. Printing and publishing is at one hundred and sixty-six point two three percent. The reason on some of these you'll find is that in FY. 20 COVID hit. So uh, this expenses that we normally see go through there are for um, retirement, awards, things like that. So that is why you, you saw the decrease in 20 when compared to other years. So, but it falls in line with the five year average. Just wanted to note that. And, and, and one thing I want to make thing we, when we hear this, you know, up 166%, yeah. it's, it's a $10,000 item. Exactly. Not, not that every penny doesn't count, but when I'm looking, I look at both those items because when you're talking nine to ten, that's a big jump, but it's not a five hundred thousand to eight hundred thousand. So some of this stuff is, you know, very tight to the belt at some point, and then also, like you said, something happens, it can change. But the percentages look awful, but it's not as big a dollar amount as some of these other categories. That's a very good point to to make because um, that percentage it does look like a lot, but we're looking at small dollar amounts. And, and, I mean, and I'm, I'm not belittling any small dollars, but you know it's not a major thing where we've all gone off fifty or hundred thousand dollars. These are very small amounts. You know, when you're trying to hit something in postage, like, you know what what happens? They raise that every two days. Exactly, exactly. Uh, the next one is printing and processing supplies. Again, to what Mr. Smith was saying, the actual for fiscal year 20 was 396. The budget is 740. So it does look like a 186 percentage, but it's in line with the five-year average. And um, this right here, um, postage was less because of COVID in March. So that's supplies under admin. The next one is other charges. Again, if we look at travel for admin, it looks like it's there's a big increase. However, this is because of COVID. Uh, there could be some potential savings of maybe a thousand. There's just not much in in there. Um, this would be used for the finance department and other. Um, 
departments. ASBO every year in May, they have a training that uh, we usually attend. It's a great networking. We learn a lot as far as any new laws with procurement, different things that other finance departments are doing. So um, that would fall in this category as well. But let's be honest, a lot of everything's going by Zoom now, so. Yes. We might be Keep Zoom that in. on the back burner. <laughs> yes, definitely. And then the other item here under admin would be your professional improvements. And this right here is reserved for any professional certification. Let's say if someone in Mrs. Bass's department got the SHRM designee, then um, this would be where the board would uh, pay for that out of there. And we're only talking about $2,500 on this one. So if we go down to the bottom of total of admin, you can see when we compare the budget of fiscal year 21 to the actual of 20, it's only up 1.76%. And I just uh, wanted to mention too as well, we have that Google Drive for any questions, because I know there's a, there's a lot of numbers here, so please post any questions there and we can review questions next week too if you think about it tonight or this week. All right, moving right, I'll, oh, I'm sorry. Nope, okay. Uh, next one is mid-level administration. And mid-level administration is going to be your central office supervisors, the secretaries, as well as your principals and, and their secretarial support. So when you have these numbers on here, is that including a step in a percent? No. This, we're just looking at any, any variances from actual of 20, looking at budgeted for 21, and any potential savings that maybe we can see going forward and realizing any variance, because we want to make sure that when we look at the set in the budget for 22, that those numbers are reflective of what we're going to see going forward. Okay, thank you. Item of note, and I'm going to come back to this, but I have under Supervisors 105, uh, there's a slight increase, and I have line 25. We'll come back to that. There might be some potential um, savings there that I want to uh, point out, but that goes into instruction that carries forward here. The next one is Secretarial 1051. Uh, there's some potential savings here. The budget for fiscal year 21 was 150,875. If you notice the trend over the last two years in 19 and 20 was 105 and 67. There's potential for us to reclass some salaries into grants and that's been done the past two years. So we wanna take a look at that. It's based upon their time and effort sheet. First, can I ask a quick question, though? Yes. On the first page with the administration where we talked about the secretary hourly, mm -hmm. what secretary, where are those secretaries, the ones that we paid hourly, where were they located? Are they here at central office? Right. I think it's around $1,200 as far as year to date for fiscal year 22, and it would be anyone that um, we've asked to come in to sit up front for coverage. And then where are the secretarial and clerical that we're talking about there with the 150,000, where are they located? They're actually located um, in the schools themselves. Okay, Good. thank you. First. Okay, um, the next one is leave payout under mid-level administration. You can see that um, it just depends year to year. It's hard to budget for. So that's total mid-level administration under salary. If we look in contracted services, we see under consultants, 11,180, and that's gonna be your data-wise. Also, I wanna bring an item of note that um, we took for the county, for board approval and county commissioner approval, school funds online. So this line item is actually budgeted low. It should be $20,000 more because we need that in the schools. There's accounting software, they use school funds online. It keeps track of all their individual school accounts. It allows them to collect online payments and lets them to send out um, bills to each individual student or by grade level and so forth. 
So that's contracted services under mid-level administration, office supplies, again, because of COVID and there's potential savings there to, to look at. Uh, actual for fiscal year 20 was 5,946, budgeted is 13,220. When all these schools had to send out packets, where did that, where did it, did it was that charged to the school or charged the central office? It's my understanding that the packets that were sent out were uh, did qualify for CARES funding. So that, that was COVID or I, I, I believe so, okay. but I would have to check on that. I could So make some of it was covered. Some schools still had money in their postage, mm -hmm. if you will, and they used that. And then they came to central office and we distributed those and gave, make sure that they got that paid for. So it was both. It was some school. It was some central and Some of it was COVID or grant money that was used. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I remember we were passing those in the beginning. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I know we tried to back it back, but I'm certainly put a big burden on some of these schools, and especially I think in the northern part where it's more rural and you didn't have the internet connection, people would apply for more of that. I remember so the, in the beginning it was everybody. Everybody, right? So, yeah. And Dr. Kane, you said you said the last meeting that's been reduced. Oh, significantly, okay. significantly. Okay. So, let's see. That's really all items of highlight for a mid-level. You can see that the percentage increase from budget of 21 to actual was only 1.4%. We flip to the next page. We're gonna look at instruction. The first one item of note, there's a facilitator and staff specialist. You'll notice that in 21, there wasn't budgeted and that's through an LMB grant. So that's why it's it's zero. It actually got transferred to a grant. So we have it. It's just on a grant. Correct. How long is a grant for? I would have to look into that. I mean, I guess my question is, is it going to come and bite us into something real quick, or is it going to be something that's going to be for a couple of years? Right. I, it's my understanding that it's a couple of years, but okay. I will definitely find out. I'll I mean, I'm still interested, but, you know, it's grants are great until they run out. Exactly. <laughs> The other item of note that I wanted to bring to your attention is 1301 psychologist. And you can see there seems to be a huge increase from the actual of fiscal year 20 was 135,491. And you can see the budget amount was 372.91. And I wanted to let you know that's taking it from three psychologists to five. That's why you see the increase there. And a lot of that, is, they're the contract ones too, weren't they? Correct, right. Remember, we had a lot of vacancies last year, so we were able to fill them. With contracts, but yes. they weren't. Mm -hmm. And then the other variances you're going to see is COVID-related as far as um, in March, the actuals are lower in 20 than the budget in 21. So you'll see some positive variances there under the tutor, the school assistant, and so forth. Um, extended, well, it's extended days, not budgeted. On um, 1901, mm -hmm. teacher substitutes. I mean, that's, a, that's getting to be a bigger number. I mean, it's 138 percent, but it's a big number when you start to talk in a half a million dollars going up to 600. Is it that is. just a trend we're in or is it just because of, is that a COVID because teachers aren't, I mean, we haven't been in school, so we don't have substitutes. How could that be so high? Right. We do have savings in that account. So what was budgeted in 21 was 600,000. Mm -hmm. We are seeing savings in that category. However, um, keep in mind there too, and we'll have to pay close attention to the trend that um, some teachers are not able to be in the classroom. So we'll have to have a sub in, in the room too, so not sure where those costs are going to trend. Okay. Mr. Mr. Smith, just a reminder: when we were doing the budget last May, that number was 695, I and we, we put it back to 600 as a placeholder, just for just just in case because we had no idea how long COVID was going to, you know, be with us. Tars, what's the, can we go back to the 1804 with the assistant? What is that? You know, for the 191. Right. It, it looks like it's budgeted at 13000 and the actual expense was 6700 
174. I do not know that, but I'll put that out there on uh, the Google Drive. The next one I want to bring to your attention is 1005 Supervisor at a budgeted this year at 127384 and remember if I told you to place a um, in your mind we're going to go back to mid-level administration under 25 this is actually an admin mid-level admin position and we've been able to classify most of that salary I would say up to 60 percent so you'll have savings there um, through it's through title one and migrant grants going into next year. And then that's um, instruction for salaries. Can we, on the one same page, I'm sorry. Of course. Uh, because it's the first time I'm seeing this. What is extra duty? Is that when someone has a second, or they have a main position and they are doing a second position? Right. Miss Bass could probably um, elaborate more on that. But any extra duty pay? Oh, don't. I know she. She just. <laughs> she, yeah, she. She <laughs> left. She's got okay. snow already on the ground. Okay, Sorry I didn't want to jump in front. Of, yeah, I didn't want to jump in yes, front of her. Yes, there's an update. That is snowing. Oh, okay. So extra duty uh, is an additional after their duty hours, um, normally through a teacher position. Okay. And then what about the workshop participants, one, two, five, zero, because that jumped a, uh, quite a bit. What is that? Right. So I, I believe, and I can... SIT is school improvement team. So there was always a stipend. Um, I'm actually not on that one. Oh, the Tammy, workshop I'm on participants. One two five zero. One two five two. Oh, okay. Right. It actually, if we look at the five-year average, it's at 152,753. The budgeted amount is 149,337. Uh, it went down in 20, and, and my guess would be is because of COVID, they didn't have a right. The but what is that? I will definitely professional add it to professional this. development. When teachers or anybody in this instructional category, when we fund them to go to professional development. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And would that affect it? One, I mean, one professional development day was paid by COVID. No, this is workshops. Workshops, okay, mm -hmm. okay. So and even, and just to clarify, Dr. Keeney, even with their Zoom, we're paying for workshops? Well, it depends on what it is. Okay. So, say for example, if we funded teachers to participate in the Mayo conference, okay. it was virtual, but they are still a registration fee. Okay. You know, it, it just depends on what it is. Okay, thank you. Moving right along here, we're under instructions, contracted services. An item of note here would be our licensing agreements. It is actually under budget. It should, well, let me look at my notes. I have that highlighted here. For this current year, when I looked at 20, um, 21 actual numbers, as far as where we were, it was under budget. And I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. In that category is gonna be your Agile Mind, Fallet, and uh, Wonders. The next one under supp Supplies and Material, Media Supplies, at 111 percent, the five-year average is 84,365. The budget amount is 9,214. So there could be some savings realized there. The in-service supplies is budgeted at 51 or 5,100. The five-year average is 6,110. However. It was actual numbers increased in 19 and 16. Uh, if we keep going under travel and other charges, they're basically in line with the five-year trend because of 20 being COVID, the percentage look higher. 
actually under travel, it's actually a little bit less. On the um, athletics, are we, we're anticipating it being, even though we lost a season, we will we will realize savings in 21 on that, um, and the question is is okay, in 22 what's the five year trend as far as expenses, where where do we need to be? Is there any savings that we can realize? And um, those are pretty much in line with the budgeted amount with the actual expenses. And, and I you know I think we have got a very you know the five year average is a good thing to go with. Mm -hmm. Last year this budget. <laughs> You know, it's so, it's so screwed because of the of the timing of COVID and stuff. Some things are going to be out of whack. Some things are going to be very low. Um, so it's, we're going to have to really, you know, there's going to be a lot of explanations on stuff being this far off. I can see because we're just in a, a different time. Yes. So on the next page, yeah. just real quickly, could, could we? Uh, uh, you know what? I'll put it in an email to you. I'll okay. Ask, I'll ask later. It's not a big deal. Thank you. We're going on page five. We're finishing off instruction. And this was one that we actually, I, I need to bring to your attention again. This under transfers, this was for the psychologist that was um, contracted, that was um, not special ed related. This was 110,000 expense that we had this year. So we need to keep in mind when we build the budget for 22, the budget amount's 50, but we're gonna ha have 110,000 if it holds this, the same as this current year and the last couple years on that line. So that's instruction. The next one is special education. Special education. Just going to uh, go down the line here. Um, the speech therapist, 43. There could be potential savings there on that one. I have to uh, get with Ms. Smith. But you can see the actual for 20 is 245,872. The budget is 326,952. And it may be one of those situations where we couldn't get somebody as far as an employee and had to contract out. The next one is teacher homeward bound. Again, uh, even though the um, it's 15,000 budgeted for 21, the actual was 3,108, and because of COVID, it looks like um, that's why that wasn't used as much. The five-year average is close to 11,000, so there might be potential savings there. A question to have for the supervisor. The next one under. Contracted services, consultants, 2003. Just want to bring to your attention that, um, let's see, we, we transferred some salaries into the contract line because we had some consultants. And that's on the uh, transfer notice that we have here. It was the first one dated December 9th, hours to contracted services for 375000 But that's been all absorbed within that special ed budget. So it's basically moving it from salaries, bumping it down to that contracted service line. An item of note, too, would be legal services. It's budgeted for 30. The five-year average is 15,480. This year, I would, um, looking at the actuals, it's more in line with the 30,000 that we're gonna spend. The next item is materials of instruction. And again, it, the supplies were less than 20. However, the five-year average is is right in line with what has been budgeted for that position. 
on the next page, we're going into transfers. I was kind of real quick on the bottom of one of that, on the other charges for travel. What does what is the travel for? Um, I know it's not a lot of money, but I'm just curious as to what that went to. Dr. Kane, do some of the therapists go on on site to individual residences or? Yeah, yeah. There's there's travel involved with the therapist and um, speech. The ones that we contract, we do cover mileage for them. So if they're assigned to a school and they, when they go out to that home or whatever, <clears throat> then that's covered with a yeah. mileage figure. Mm -hmm. But I can get further clarification too. If yeah, because I would because if we're talking about the speech therapist. It seems like that whole contract would have included. Well, we we actually have a mixture of both. We have okay. salaried okay. and contracted services. Right, but if the con if it's a, if the speech therapist was contracted, I thought their contract covered it, part of their it, it, trial. It, it should, but okay. I, I will okay. I will double check on that. But you also have occupational therapists. You have physical therapists. I mean, besides speech with their speech pathology, so a lot of them, if they're contracted, we pay for their mileage. Am I correct, Dr. King? Yes. Yep. We, but we can get you the titles of people who are in this line. Uh, the, the next one I want to bring your attention to is under transfers. The first line item is going to be the special ed consortium. The actual cost in 20 was 313,983. This year, the cost was 438, um, let me see. Four thirty eight nine eighty three 983 because we had to do, if we look at transfer notice number January 6, 310,000 to con consortium and non-public placements. So that puts it into to line of what the actual costs were. Dr. Kane tasked uh, the supervisor, Ms. Smith and myself to look at um, the cost if we were to take all the consortium in-house as far as the services that they provide and then um, what is there would it be cheaper for us to do it that way or is it um, more cost effective for us to stay with the consortium and it would through the analysis there was quite a bit of savings to stay with the consortium because the course consortium is, it used to be five counties, now it's four counties that partner and share special education services. Uh, some, some of the savings that are realized is through professional development, the re retirement is paid through the consortium and not through us directly. What county dropped out? Kent. Okay. The next one is your non-public placement. And that increased to question from Ms. Morissette from last time. There is um, 11 now uh, currently that we have, uh, Ms. I confirmed with Ms. Smith, in non-public placement. She researched if any of them were able to graduate. Uh, there's there's one that's, that's close, but um, needs another half a year, I think, as far as total credits. And she did want to put on the radar for us that there could be a potential one coming in for fiscal year 22. Thank you. We have no idea where they'd be going. Exactly. All right. The next one is student support services. The variance there um, would be a difference in, in employees. There was a different um, person in that position in the prior years than this year, so that's why there's a variance there. Secretarial and clerical. And looking at that, this puts it on track with the actual cost for 22. There could be a, a little bit of savings, but only a couple thousand on there. The next one, workshop participants. You can see the actual for 22 is 7,300. Budgeted is 11,000. 
potential savings, but could have COVID have dropped that number down too as well. Supplies, very a small number in here. Budgeted 2,000, actual was 1,410. Travel, again, it, the budget amount is 5,500. It's in line with the five-year average of 5,994. And that's student services. The next one is healthcare services. Healthcare services, you'll see an increase from 20 at 20,703 to budgeted for 21, 71,534. And that's gonna be your nurse coordinator. She was hired um, towards the end of fiscal year 20, so that's why there's small expenses there. And then the full budgeted amount for 21. The nursing at 1460, the budget amount is 855,455. The actual last year was 7,964. So that's healthcare services taking a look at. There's not many accounts under that category. When we dive into transportation, Take a look at the one variance, the leave payout. It's hard to budget for that, but um, it was actually budgeted for 25,000 for 21. That may be a savings there to look at for transportation. Hopefully nobody will be leaving us. Well, we, we look at this in driver trainers. Is that, a new, is that a new position training both our drivers and uh, contractor? Uh, Ms. Pullen, did you want to? It's not a new position. There was a retirement in there, so there is someone new that has started in that position. So if we if we keep going down, the actual for twenty for uh, twenty four seventy is five million six hundred and eight three hundred and fifty. Um, It's the cost of uh, doing business with the um, with outsourcing for those services. Bus inspections, again, budget amount twelve thousand, actual ten thousand sixty one, and then let's see, computer maintenance. We need to consider that the actual costs are running about 8,000 under contracted services, but um, I'm gonna that's make a our, That's note. probably doing our bus routes and stuff like that. And I think so, but I'm gonna dive That's a question. In. Ms. Pullen, is this our last year of contract with the bus, con bus LLC contractors? Yeah, this would be the third year. Okay, thank you. Right, they go through 22, yes. To the end of 22? To the end of 22. Correct. Okay, thank you. The next one is bus operations under supplies. Um, I'm sorry, can oh, we yes. go to bu the bus repairs real quick? Yes. Stars. What, what would account for such a high um, increase in bus repairs when it seems as if they should have had a little break this year? Because we had a lot of older buses. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna interject. Ms. Pullen, am I correct? There were some older buses and they needed a lot of maintenance. Thank you. That, only because we had a whole uh, presentation on that, that's why we, we needed it to be so high in that budget. Thanks. And our, a lot of our buses are doing special uh, needs uh, trips, so you know, that was still going on more than when our schools were all virtual. So they were still running those buses because we can't provide the services in this county. I think they were still going across to the Western Shore. Some of them were. So, I mean, it's, you know, those people weren't, our contractors were maybe sitting still, but our, our buses weren't as much. Okay, thanks. <sighs> Um, as you can see, overall transportation, when we look at the budget for 21 compared to the actual in 20, as a whole, it only raised less than 0.31%. Under operations, I 
item of note would be the maintenance contracts. The maintenance contracts, we're seeing an increase and the increase is, we have Delaware, I'm sorry, um, the elevator company, what's the elevator company? Yeah, Delaware Elevator. Delaware, Delaware Elevator, Johnson Control, and BP&E Industrial. So it's my understanding that in, and Ms. Pullen, correct me if I'm wrong, in years past that some of these services were not in the operation budget, but now currently reside in there? That's correct. Uh, for a very long time, the state did all of our elevator inspections, which last year that was an expense that we had to take on and this when the state stopped theirs they stopped every other county too right. we weren't singled out the next one vehicle um, insurance to, to buildings we need to take a look at adjusting this and Right now, currently budgeted in 21 is 155,000. I'm seeing actual costs of 179. And it's not much, but why would our insurance vehicle insurance, um, like I said, it's not much, but it seems like it doubled. Did we have <laughs> some bad drivers this past year? Uh, uh, it was new vehicles and adding to the fleet. Thank you. We had a conversation about that. <laughs> Anyone hit? No, no one's no one's in an accident there. Um, the next one is heat. You can see it's budgeted at 508. The five-year average is 383. So there's potential savings, but really like to do more of analysis. Of, of course, a, there's going to be some savings hopefully in 21. However, s some of these savings we've had unexpected one-time costs that come up. So we're trying to be fiscally responsible and any savings to go ahead and allocate to those one-time. Uh, one that comes to my mind would be um, the work that was done through ServPro at the middle school. And that work can was um, absorbed by the, some of the savings here under the I remember, the was it last year or something? We had we a whole discussion about the refrigerators. It. And I mean, you know, if, if some department saves money like that and we need to upgrade something or do some one-time cost to save us money, I think it's a good time to, you know, if we have ability to do it at that time. But Mr. Smith, remember we had had a discussion about leaving it, leaving the electricity and oil heat up because we hadn't had a bad winter in a number of years. So we just didn't want to take a chance in depleting that line item in case we had a bad winter. And with, with COVID, um, Ms. Pullen's educating me on the heating systems and electricity. And I think we have to have a higher temperature, Ms. Pullen? Or? No, it's actually, no. we are bringing on our systems to circulate air two hours before the buildings are open. So okay. it's two hours before we have done it to that. We're also leaving it on longer in the evening to make sure that we're getting full circulation. So we are going to see some increase in costs for that. As we start to do this, our, our systems are already transitioning over to that. We'll be seeing that increase soon. Because then, because of COVID, we're bringing we want to bring more fresh air and turn it. Whatever if we're doing two times a day, we're going to do it three or four. Yeah. So that's going to going to cost us more money at that time. Is that a COVID expense for a grant? We haven't to this point. We haven't looked at it and. It, the line items for the new grants that we are looking at, I'm not sure that something like that would be covered, but we can take a look. Yeah, just. There, there's 15 uses for the new money and energy wasn't one of them, but. <laughs> I gotta ask. Go figure. I'm sure we're gonna spend it. You don't need electricity. <laughs> Sit the dark open the windows, keep your coat on. Right, just leave the windows open. <laughs> Uh, the last one I want to bring your attention to here under operations would be equipment. Budgeted for 21 was 20,000, and to my knowledge, that this was for the electrostatic machines. So there might be savings next year because um, if there is a need for that, then uh, they definitely would qualify for the SR2 grants. So there's potential savings there. Under maintenance, I want to bring your attention to 
There is budgeted for fiscal year 21 under construction manager. As you know, um, Ms. Pullen has been doing due role, so we'll recognize savings in, tw in 21, but um, we still do have that position open. The next one, contracted services, maintenance contracts. Let me see my notes on that one, 69. This basically adjusts to actual, so in actual fiscal year 20, there was 95,204 for maintenance of contracts. There's an increase of 109, and that falls suit to the actual that we're seeing in 21. Vehicle operations, a very small amount, but the percentage is 108. The actual for fiscal year 2020 was 22,567. The budget amount was 24,500. Again, with auto expense as well. So overall, when we look at fiscal year 21, compared to a budgeted amount compared to actual in 20, it's less than 1% increase in the total under that category. And the last one here is fixed charges. So if we go line by line under retirement, 5801, for 2020 was 2.5 million. The five-year average is 2.5. The budget amount is 3.1. There's possible savings there that we could bring into 22. Social Security, the actual for 20 was 4.4. Five-year average 4.2. The budget amount 4.7. On workman's comp insurance, we, do we have, did our actuaries like go up? Right, we, we are seeing a, a lot of claims. In fact, statewide, in addition to the claims, we're actually seeing fraudulent claims too, that we go line by line each time we get the workers' comp bill and dispute any employees that are not ours on there. And we're actually seeing it statewide. So anytime oh. that we see that, we're, we're contacting them to get those removed from that report and we short pay it. We don't pay it the full amount. Same thing with the unemployment insurance. Yes. I've noticed that there's a lot, a lot of fraud. I've had oh yes uh, as well. So I've had three already try to claim on me that uh, never worked for us. So I'm sure that you've had quite a few of those too. Yes, yes. Um, so if we look at um, different, let me go back up. Health insurance. It's fallen in suit. Actual as was 11.2. Budgeted was 11.7. There may be savings there from what Mark Lynn was saying, our partners um, with Bolton Partners, is that he's not projecting to see an increase for next year. He's gonna get back to us in another couple weeks, but he's projecting that it stays um, where it is on there. Does that include the retirees' health insurance as well? Yes. And just, oh, we'll talk about it later. Okay. I'll ask a question later. Okay, okay. Um, so that pretty much fixed charges, there's going to be some savings that we could possibly bring into 22 on that, um, depending upon um, any uh, increases that we have to account for for Social Security and Medicare that will be associated if there's um, any increases. Our response is the blood bank. The blood bank? I mean, there's no money attached, but no. what is that? Um, I, I think years ago, and I wish Ms. Bass was here, I think they could, or I don't even know. I'm going to have to ask that one. If it's like the state, if you donate blood, you get so many times a year, you get a day of leave. I don't know if that's, okay. if the schools ever did anything like that. Right, but to your point, there hasn't been anything in there, so we, we need to actually inactivate that. Thank you. So in, in looking at the five-year average, 
we can tell what's been budgeted in, in 21 compared to the prior um, actual numbers and see if there's any potential savings anywhere where there's adjustments that need to be made when we continue to bill fiscal year 22 budget. Now you had us replace the expenses. Are we keeping in our book the revenue comparison? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What we were thinking for next week would be the capital budget, then taking a look at staffing, um, where we are as far as open positions, if there's any savings potentially there, um, where we are staffing in the school buildings that we can take a look at those numbers by school, by grade, by um, student enrolled. And when I went through my book, I guess the principals have put in what they requested for additional staff in each, I mean, I saw some of them in there. Correct. What and they put in for each mm -hmm. school that they would like to see. That was part of the first presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's for me. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Howard. Thank you. Action items, um, 3-01, um, we've had a presentation on Edmund contract. Is there any other, we've asked for discussion if people were here for that. Is there any other discussion on that? Do I hear a motion? I make a motion to accept the exact path by Edmentum. Um, a fiscal impact of $87,249. Budget source is the FY 2020 operating budget and part of the FY 2020 capital budget. Um, if, if I could, I'm so sorry. Um, we had to have a change to that yellow sheet. Okay. Um, we are looking at ESSER funds for this, ESSER 1 funds. Mm -hmm. um, so this would... That's... Yes, and that needs to be updated on there. What, this contract will begin on July the 1st, 2021, continuing any programs that will still be running from 2021 to 22 school year. Fiscal impact, 87, 249. Uh, budget, no. Budget source, that's for fund number one funds. Yes, Title and that one, needed to be updated. I'm sorry about that. So it'll be coming from that. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Eyes have it. There is. Our next thing, uh, we've discussed the clay target, and that is going to be brought back with a better, not a better, uh, some more information on the uh, thing, and we'll get some clarifications on how that's going to be done. I make a motion to table uh, the clay target team for further discussion. Second. Okay, discussion. That can be tabled to next week. To whenever the to whenever the information is available. Okay, so caller said she'd get back to us. Hopefully, next week we'll put it on. If you don't, then we'll get it. We'll be in touch with you to find out where we can make a decision, how we're going to make that decision, and clarify that because my understanding is we have to March twenty second. Twenty second. So we need to act on this in the next couple meetings or something. Okay. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any dis more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes. Okay, our future um, work sessions will be February the 17th, and we will have another one on February the 29th. I'm sorry, 24th, I'm sorry. And our regular school board meeting will be March the 3rd. Our schools will be to our hybrid program next Tuesday. We've discussed that, and like uh, I think everybody said, be safe, but please, if you're... Uh, children or students have any kind of issues, uh, as Michelle said, anything, pink eye, strep throat, cold, cold, uh, let's err on the side of caution so we can hopefully get rolling next week and then move on as we've discussed with Mark and some other members uh, trying to get this even open farther if we can in the future. Uh, do I have any other discussions? Good for the thing? Motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.